Hello. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the Sundaland theory. And the question is, of course, is Sundaland Atlantis? First of all, what is this strange word that I'm saying in this video? Sundaland is actually this continent right here. This presently, this this region that I'm that I'm outlining in red is actually um, divided into different regions. For example, you have Southeast Asia, you have Malaysia, you have in the various Indonesian islands. But when the sea level was 120 meters lower, or around 400 feet lower during the glacial maximum, you had this entire area, which is continental shelf right here. This is very shallow water. It's less than around 400 feet deep. So all of this land was actually dry land when the sea levels were lower during the Ice Age. And as the Ice Age ended and the earth warmed, the seas rose, and the rising seas submerged the the low-lying lands that are that are shaded in the in the lighter beige color, leaving eventually the the outlines of the continents and the islands as they ex exist today. However, this was a most of the sea level rise took place in a very short period of time between around thirteen thousand to around twelve thousand years ago, and so. The advantage of this idea and this theory is that we know that this actually happened. We have very detailed re records of sea level changes that took place within the last um, 20,000 to 30,000 years even. And we know for a fact that this Sundaland landmass really did exist as is being drawn. And so this isn't just an idea that Atlantis researchers came up on their own initiative, but this is an idea that has been has been sourced and borrowed from from a reliable, reputable scientific um, body of knowledge. And so who are the main supporters of the Sundaland theory? There are two main proponents of this idea, generally speaking. And they, they kind of focus their uh, attention on two different specific areas of Sundaland, for example. Sundaland is a very large landmass, and so it, it could very well be that, for example, this part of Sundaland and this part of Sundaland, I'm just drawing two, two, drawing two, ex, uh, coming up with two examples, someone could, it's easily large enough to fit different areas that each, each Atlantis researcher might want to focus on. And it turns out that that is the case, in fact. Aricio Santos, a professor of nuclear engineering at a Brazilian, a uh, Brazilian, University, he has actually passed away since. He wrote a book called Atlantis, the Lost Continent, Finally Found. And he was probably one of the first, if not the first, um, the first researcher who really uh, wrote a scientific, scientifically sound book suggesting that this area near Indonesia or Sundaland was Atlantis. And so the other, the other um, author, he is still alive. His name is Donnie Arwanto. His, his, he's a civil engineer and a hydro, hydro engineer by profession. And he wrote the book, Atlantis, the Lost City is in Java Sea. And it turns out that these two proponents really do place different emphasis on different areas within Sundaland. For example, Donnie Arwanto believes that Atlantis is right here. And Aricio Santos believes that Atlantis is here. Specifically, Aricio Santos believes it is in the South China Sea basin, whereas uh, Donny Arwanto believes that it's in the Java Sea in particular. And so, what are the... And of course, the central assumption made here is that the Atlantic Ocean, as Plato knew it, is different from the Atlantic Ocean as we define it, because... Plato, in the time of the Greeks, the, they believed that there was this one all-world-encompassing ocean named, named Okeanos or Oceanos. And that conception is generally considered identical with, with the Atlantic Ocean. And so this idea that the Atlantic Ocean encompassed the entire world ocean, and hence if Plato said that Atlantis came from the Atlantic Ocean, that can mean really the entire world ocean. And so the idea is that based on that uh, broader definition of the Atlantic Ocean, 
um, these places that are that are far outside the Atlantic as we define it can still be regarded as possible candidates for Atlantis, consistent with the dialogues of Plato. That's an interpretation that these authors have made. And I think that that interpretation is a little bit on shaky ground, but it's not completely absurd. It's there. There is a rationale behind it. So let's move forward with that information in mind. And so this is really a map of the post-glacial sea level rise. And we see that uh, most of the sea level rise took place within a reasonably short amount of time. For example, the Holocene, during the Holocene period within the last 8,000 years, we had very little sea level rise, whereas between 20,000 to around 15,000 years ago, we also had very little sea level rise. And then we had all of this rise concentrated into this brief, relatively brief period of time. And so this is the map that, um, that justifies, uh, that proves that soon the land really was submerged. And what are the strengths of the Sunda land Java sea theory? Because there are many. One of them is that Indonesia is highly active tectonically and <clears throat> volcanically. And, and that's one of the characteristics, especially the tectonically portion. Atlantis doesn't mention a volcano, but we know that volcanoes and earthquakes tend to go together, generally speaking. And that, and that we know for sure that Indonesia is a tectonically active region with many, many earthquakes and volcanoes. In fact, the most violent and the most destructive earthquakes and volcanoes in the world generally have come from Indonesia. And also we know that the sea level rise did happen. This isn't a matter of opinion, it's a matter of fact. And so any Atlantis research that bases itself on this fact is at least sound in that respect. And also the size of Sundaland and Java Sea is also similar in the general order of magnitude and probably within a few 10% range to Plato's Atlantis. It's not off by this incredible amount, right? Sundaland isn't the size of a full continent, which would probably make it too big for Atlantis, nor is it the size of a tiny island, for example, like Santorini or Theria, which is far too small for Atlantis. And also we know that uh, the flora and the fauna, the plants and animals living in the region, are actually very similar to the, to, to the flora and fauna of Atlantis, for example. Elephants actually live in Sundaland and Java Sea to this day. As was stated by Plato in that supposed 12,000-year-old world. And it is, in fact, kind of a tropical paradise, as Atlantis was described as also. And so we have that kind of basic similarity that we have to work with. There's also abundant mineral resources. Atlantis was said to have the super abundance of mineral resources. Maybe it's questionable as to whether Indonesia is that endowed and that blessed with these minerals, but one can clearly say that they have a certain amount of mineral resources that are actively being mined today. There's also problems with the Sunderland or Java Sea theory. One of the problems is the definition of the Atlantic Ocean, as we mentioned previously. But that is a problem that we can kind of maybe work around. It's not that interpretation of the Atlantic as the entire world ocean encompassing both the Indian and the Pacific Oceans, as we define it, is somewhat uh, sensible in a way, as I've said. The biggest problem, I believe, is that the sea level rise didn't happen fast enough to drown Atlantis in a single day and night, as was said by Plato. And so we know for a fact that the sea level did rise, and that map in which we showed the sea level rise seems to really make it seem like the sea level rise happened a lot faster than it actually did. Remember in that map there was like a slope with the meltwater pulse 1A, which is like this steep. It, went, it started like this, it went like that, it went like that, and then it went like this. Well, even during this period of the sea level rise, which seems like it should be very, very large, when you look at it, that's still a sea level rise of only around, like, maybe a meter every, like, 100 or 200 years. You never had a sea level rise that actually happened just, like, 10 meters or 5 meters in a single day or in a single year, the sea level rise was still gradual. It wouldn't have been significant enough for an average person to really even notice it over a lifetime, let alone a single day and night. 
And so the idea that the sea levels just this was a catastrophic sea level rise has to is not really uh, tenable in a sense. One of the biggest problems with the theory is that the mountains surrounding the plain, as described by Plato in this in the dialogue, those mountains were described as being celebrated for their number and size and beauty far beyond any which still exists. And the any which still exists is, is referring to the fact that the island of Atlantis was destroyed and hence those mountains do not exist anymore. That's the first problem. The mountains clearly still exist in this theory as I will show you. And also, are those mountains of Indonesia that celebrated for their number and size and beauty? I, I don't think so. Those mountains aren't very high at all. For example, in the South China Sea Plain, the mountains surrounding the South China Sea Plain are only a few thousand feet high. And also the Java Sea Plain, the mountains of Java, Sumatra, and Borneo which surround the Java Sea are only a few thousand feet at high at most. They are not celebrated beyond any which still exist for their, for their size and their beauty. For example, these mountains in Vietnam, these mountains in Malaysia, if you can call them mountains, and this area of Borneo, if this was the plain of Atlantis, then these certainly surround that. And these mountains aren't very high, they are not impressive, they are certainly not to be described in a superlative sense, as for example, the Andes, the Himalayas definitely would, the, the Alps would certainly, and perhaps the Rocky Mountains, and several other mountain ranges in the world could be described in that superlative sense, but but these mountain ranges, even for someone who was only familiar with the Greek world, it wouldn't be fair to describe those mountains as, as greater in size beyond any which still exists today. And as for the theory that, that the Java Sea was Atlantis, this actually makes a little bit more sense because we see that the Java Sea plain is very, very much rectangular if we could imagine that this was a this was a dry plain at one point, which it actually was. But the mountains which surround the Java Sea Plain are, again, far from exceeding any that ever existed. And the fact is that they still exist today, too. So, so the description of these mountains as not existing anymore, first of all, is flawed. And they are simply not high enough and great enough to really merit that superlative designation. So as we've seen, the theory of Sundaland has its advantages and disadvantages, and it's an interesting theory, far more interesting than the than the um, than the Santorini theory, which is just totally not, which is totally oversimplifying the story of Atlantis and trying to fit it into this false, um, false whole, this putting it, trying to fit it into this this false category that's just way too. It's not doing this Atlantis story its proper due. It's not giving it its proper due. But the problem with the Sunderland theory, I think, is that it's kind of being too expansive. It's being too liberal in its interpretation of the story, whereas the Santorini theory is being too conservative with it. And overall, I would say that it's a theory that's worth looking into, but I don't think we're going to be finding Atlantis in Indonesia.